Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. Early breakfast with Callum MacDonald. Good morning to you. 18 minutes past five. We've got Alexander Hammond with us, fellow of the Young Voices UK Network and policy analyst at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Good morning, Alexander. Good morning. Thanks Thank, for having me. It's our pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, let's have a little look through some of the big stories of this morning. Uh, so alongside the royal family, Meg Split is the front page of The Sun. Of course, that interview coming up this weekend. Uh, but one of the dominant stories really on the front pages is around um, it's sort of fallout from the budget, really. Uh, the I front page, NHS fury as heroes of the pandemic get 1% pay rise. Medics accuse ministers of failing the NHS staff who are getting the nation through the pandemic and risking burnout. It's being described as a kick in the teeth, as an insult to NHS heroes. Um, so this is this has really become the, the focal point of criticism for the Chancellor post budget. Mm -hmm. Well, what I think is interesting about this is the health unions have asked for a pay rise of 12.5%, which is absolutely enormous considering the year we've just had. There's more than 1.3 million. NHS staff. It's, it's the eighth largest employer in the world, more than Foxconn, more than the Russian army. And often when you hear the words pay rise for the NHS, you think it's just going to be frontline workers. Whereas in reality, only about 40% of NHS are actually on the front line, if not less. And back in September, when loads of uni health unions came together and asked for a pay rise, included people like dentists, or the physiotherapist union or the dietetic um, association. All these people who, sure, they do great work for the UK economy, but it's not related to the COVID struggle. And what's interesting is that last summer, the HR consultant, expert HR, found that the majority of private sector workers will not get a pay rise this year, which does mean they'll be worse off after inflation. Mm. And they, it's not just the NHS staff who have been extremely important to us during the pandemic. Supermarket workers have been extremely important. Amazon delivery workers have been extremely important. Many in the private sector have helped us through. So I don't quite get why it should just be NHS staff who should be getting the pay rise. Well, is it, but, is, but is it naive to suggest that, you know, at the moment we're paying billions of pounds for people to not work? And actually, if we can find billions of pounds in that context, surely, uh, post-pandemic even, we could uh, we could stump up some cash to pay people like NHS staff and even like the others that you mentioned to, to reward them for the efforts that have gone into getting us all through this thing. However, I, I agree to you, but back in July, there was... Um, a pay rise for doctors, teachers of 3.1%. Um, and that is despite the fact that most private sector workers are facing a pay freeze. So I don't quite understand why the NHS should get the special treatment in this sense, whereas others won't. Um, especially just, I know people say, okay, the NHS workers have had a really tough year, but we all have, and we've all contributed um, to our to keep keep things normal throughout the yeah. um, COVID struggle, and the Chancellor could save upwards of twenty three billion pounds over the next three years if he was to freeze public sector pay. Mm. Uh, interesting, there's a text here from David in Corby. He says, nearly a year ago, the Prime Minister led the uh, the, um, the clap for uh, NHS staff. Bravo to that. Fast forward to now, what does the government do but undervalue the amazing work that has been carried out on the front line in the battle against the pandemic and recommend a pitiful 1% pay rise, is what David says. Um, I want to put this story up against the front page of The Times this morning, actually, because um, the Conservatives have enjoyed a significant bounce in the polls, reports The Times, since Wednesday. Today's budget. Of course, they announced tax rises. They announced uh, all sorts of things. The continuation of the furlough scheme. We've covered that in a lot of detail this week. But interesting, just to observe that the Tories have now have a 13-point lead over Labour. Alexander. Yeah. Well, I think the reason for that is a lot of people bought into Rishi Sunak's sentiment that he was going to keep taxes low for the ordinary person, um, and he did this stealthily by freezing various allowances. And even if we assume normal inflation between now and 2026, it means the normal person will face capital gains tax of upwards of £283 more 
basic income tax of £500 more, pensions allowance by £35,000. So I think a lot of people have bought into his sentiment that he's not uh, actually increasing taxes, even though he is sneakily. And I think also a lot of people quite like the fact that corporation tax is rising because they don't understand the economic truism that any rises in corporation tax have to be basically shouldered either by consumers, labour or capital, which will affect the prices of things. Um, and it's not just these corporations who uh, pay more taxes, but it's actually going to affect the economy as a whole. And the Institute of Fiscal Studies found that this was the biggest tax rising budget since 1993, which is really, really tough for the UK economy, because right now, when we look at a 70-year average, we're already um, at, at the highest tax rate for a very long time. And it's likely the Boris Johnson government will reside over the highest tax burden since Clement Attlee's administration. Attlee was a self-proclaimed socialist. Boris Johnson claims he has libertarian tendencies. <laughs> so I, I think there's a funny contradiction there um, that will be very damaging for the UK economy, especially considering how large our deficit is at the moment. Mm. It's Our deficit is upwards of 350 billion pounds that's about a third of the world's gdp put together um, for, for individual nation states about a third of the world's countries just so, as, a, as, a, as another thought just sorry to interrupt on the corporation tax and the and the ifs and we are going to look in that a bit more, in a bit more detail a bit later on as well but the institute for fiscal studies uh, also predicts there's only a 50 50 chance that the corporation tax hike to 25 percent will actually happen well, yeah, I, I, I do believe that. Um, the OECD has regularly called the corporate income taxes as the most harmful for economic growth. Um, and what the corporation tax increase also shows is that there's a contradiction in government policies. On the one hand, the Chancellor introduced the uh, policy that for some businesses, especially in the uh, machinery and house building sector, that they can get 130% off uh, or back from the tax man if they make investments. So that does encourage investments, although it might not be good investments, because if you know you can get money back from what you're investing at a higher rate of what you're spending, you, you're, you're incentivized just to spend on virtually anything just to get the money out the door. Um, so that policy is aimed to increase investment, yeah. whereas the OBR uh, even stated very recently when I released a report that the increase in corporation tax will lower investment. And that makes sense because the less money businesses have, the less they can invest in things that promote economic growth, like productivity increases. Mm. Um, Alexander, thank you very much. Thanks for your analysis this morning. Really lovely to have you on the programme. We'll speak again soon. That's Alexander Hammond, a fellow of the Young Voices UK Network and a policy analyst at the Institute of Economic Affairs.